Any questions before I get started? Mm. Before we get started? Other than the trip that Michael Douglas trying to plan. <laughs> did you, Dwight, did you see the email I just sent you? I did, I did. Thank you. That was really interesting. Just figure, just figure you should know that some of them are still around and growing. All right, all right. <laughs> yes, Kathy, I saw your hand. Yep, I had a question. Um, what is the connection with Bellum and Pergama? Or okay. was there a connection? There is a connection. Yeah. Thank you for asking. So we will talk yeah. about the connection between Balaam and yeah. Pergamum. That's a yes. that's an important thing to know. Uh, and one of the things that's important about it is that it's a thing that keeps getting repeated in the scripture. So I, I ask you to look at Numbers chapter, was it 21 22. through 20? 22, 22 to 25. Wow. Numbers chapter 22 to 25. Mm -hmm. It begins to lay out those things, but in the book of Jude, uh, in the book of Peter, yeah. First Peter, there are places where there, this is, Balaam is referred to, and it's something that I think the church universal needs to pay attention to, and not just the church at Pergamum. <laughs> so we will talk about Balaam and Pergamum. Mm -hmm. Is that all right? Yeah. Okay, now <laughs> let me just ask you this. Is it because of Balaam's actions, what he did? Because it was mentioned before in one of our studies, I believe in Galatians. Uh -huh. And um, is it Balaam's actions that is what he's being produced? It's what Balaam did. Yeah. Okay. So, so if you look at Numbers chapter twenty-two. Yeah. And so we look, we look at Numbers chapter twenty through to twenty-five. We won't take time to read it all, but hopefully you had a chance to read it. Uh, and so that's the thing what he did and the reason he did what he did I think are very very important to understand about this particular church in Pergamum and for the church universal there are things that we have to be aware of so that we might be able to live the life that Jesus wants us to live so it's the things that Balaam did both in public and hey, in private with my phone Okay. And so I think it's important for us to understand yeah, why he happen. did what he did and why he did what he did. Anybody know why he did what he did? <laughs> for, uh, <laughs> the money he wanted for, the money. For money. money. For money. For money. And so the king of the Moabites had, had asked him to come. Numbers yeah. chapter 22, 23, 24, and 25. The king of the Moabites Ask Balaam, who was a prophet before God, to come and curse the Israelites. Mm -hmm. Israel had destroyed all the people coming before them. They had torn on all the neighbors that of the Moabites had, it had seen. And they asked Balaam to come and prophesy and to curse Israel for them. So they offered him money. And he said, no, I can't go and curse who God is blessed. Mm -hmm. And so they went back and they came back a second time with more money and more stuff and say, Come on, won't you just give us a good curse so that we can live? And Balaam right. said, no, I can't do what God, I cannot curse people that God has blessed already. Mm -hmm. And then they came back a third time with even more money and more gifts and more things. And they said, come, why don't you come with us to our home and figure out how you can, how you can bless, how you can curse Israel for us. And Balaam said, okay, I'll go with you. But I remember I can only bless people who God has blessed. I can't curse people who God has cursed. And that's where we hear the story of Balaam's donkey that spoke. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so if we all heard the story in the Bible about the jackass that spoke, Balaam was trying to go up the mountain and the, jack and the donkey wouldn't move. And he kept kicking the donkey and the donkey said, what's wrong with you? Don't you see the angel right here trying to kill us? <laughs> he didn't see it. <laughs> Balaam was not spiritually in tune. He was following along. And the king of Moab, Bo, Bo, uh, Balaam goes to Moab and he sits there and says, I told you, I cannot curse people that God has blessed. And so Balaam does not curse the people. And he blesses, he, he says, I can only bless what God is going to do. I can't curse them. And so he gives them a blessing. Mm -hmm. And as he is leaving, 
with with the things he says to them and he gives them information so if you read further on i think in numbers chapter 31 israel comes in and destroys moab but they don't kill the women okay they sleep with them and one of the things that balaam had told moab is the way to get israel is by having the women come and tempt them into adultery mm -hmm. And so when, when Israel defeated Moab, they killed all the men, but they did not kill the women. And wasn't, the Ruth women a Moab, wasn't Ruth a Moabitess? Ruth was yeah. a Moabitess. Yeah. yeah. And it killed all the men, but not the women. And what happened is that the women of Moab led the people astray. Mm -hmm. The women of Moab led the people astray. And so they were no longer following the one true God. The women introduced their idols and the, women, and the men of Israel began to worship multiple gods. And so here we have Balaam who has done work for money <laughs> to lead people astray. Mm -hmm. Let's read Revelation chapter 2. If someone has that for us, let's read verses 12 through 17. If someone has Revelation chapter 2. Uh, let me see. Which You don't care which version you I have? I do not. And you want verse 12 through? 12 through 17. Okay. Uh, I'm reading from the New King James Version. And the angel of the church of Pergamos write, these things says he who has the sharp two-edged sword. I know your works and where you, where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, and you hold fast to my name and did not deny my faith. Even in the days in which Antipas was my faithful martyr who was killed among you, where Satan dwells, but I have a few things against you because you have, the, you have there those who hold doctrine who taught Bala to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit sexual immorality. Thus, you also have those who hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans which things I hate, repent, or else I will come to you quickly and will fight against you, uh, mm. fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna to eat, and I will give him a white stone, and on the stone a new name written, which no one knows except him who receives it. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Anything you want to share with us about Pergamon? Well, Pergamon is a city that's built at least a thousand feet up on a hill. Uh -huh. And it's like a fortress. And uh, it's where Satan lives. Uh -huh. And it has four cults. There. All right. All right. Very hard to serve the Lord. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. That's great. That's great. So it was not a port city like Ephesus and Smyrna yeah. was, yeah. but it was built as Sylvester as said on a hill, way yeah. above the hill, so that you could see the city from the Mediterranean, which was like fifteen miles away. You could see the city in the horizon, and it was right. built up on a hill. It was the political capital. So it wasn't necessarily the center of commerce. It was the political capital. When Alexander the Greek and the Greeks came in 400 years before this writing, Pergamum was the, was the capital of his reign. And so Rome, after they took over, would still become the political capital here. And so what, what, what Jesus says to the church at Pergamus, it says, I know where you live and you live where Satan sits. And what it says? Yes. Well, yeah, you live where Satan 
has his throne where Satan's seat is. And as Sister Avesta was saying is that there was a temple to Athena built on the side of a cliff that was more than a thousand feet in the air. And in front of the temple to Athena was the altar of Zeus. And the altar of Zeus looked like a throne mm -hmm. sitting on the side of a mountain. Mm -hmm. And all day long, they burned incense to Zeus at this altar. Mm -hmm. And so whenever you pass by Pergamum, you saw, you saw smoke coming out of this altar. I, I wish you could have been, I tried to send you some pictures in the video, but I wish you can imagine having this temple built on the side of a mountain, a thousand feet in the air, that looks like a big chair where the God gets to sit. And so Jesus says to the church of Pergamos, I know where you live and you live where Satan's seat is. Mm -hmm. Yes, Sister Lynn. You will have to unmute yourself in order to speak. <laughs> you've raised your hand, but you've not unmuted. If so, she left the room. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Lynn has left the room. <laughs> maybe she's having difficulty connecting. And so there is, as, as Sister Vesta said, they had these four cults. There was the cult of Athena. There was the cult of Zeus. There was the cult of Caesar. So it was the center of Caesar worship. And remember what people had to do to worship Caesar, right? Mm -hmm. You had to bow down. Once a year, you had to pass through the temple of Caesar and burn incense and say, Caesar is Lord. Mm -hmm. If you did not do that, you could be killed, mm -hmm. imprisoned, or mm -hmm. set on fire. Wow. wow. Once a year, everybody had to pass through the temple. Everybody who lived in Pergamos had to pass through the temple and burn incense to Caesar. Mm -hmm. and say Caesar is Lord. Lynn says she could not unmute, but is there a, is a question why they would place themselves there? Why the people, that, why the church of Pergamos would be there? Is that what you're asking? Yeah, that's a good question. Why wouldn't they be there? Well, if they knew that Satan lived there, I think I would move on. Please, yes. Get the heck out of Dodge. But, the, but, the, but the, the responsibility of the church is to go out to all the world and well, make that's disciples. Too. Right. If I only go around people that are already saved, what disciples am I making? No. Oh, you're right. And so one of the reasons that the church in Pergamos was started is because it was a political capital. And if they could form a church in Pergamos, then they would have opportunity to disseminate the word of God throughout all the political capitals in the world. Because it was the center of the Roman government, everybody from all across the known world would come there and they would have the opportunity to minister to all sorts of people who would come and the word of God would spread. Mm -hmm. Doesn't mean that everything we do for the Lord is comfortable. It's not always going to be comfortable, but God does indeed have a plan for us. Uh, yes, Sister Sylvia. But didn't the very opposite happen? They ended up getting assimilated into the Moabite uh, way of thinking. So instead of going and spreading the word, the gospel and the word, they ended up getting you know, compromising themselves and to the point that they became more mm -hmm. like the Moabites. Isn't that and not the Moabites, but the people in, in Pergamon, the Pergamon. People in Pergamon, yeah. Right. So I think it is important to know where well, yes, they want you can say they weren't strong enough to handle it. One of the things I think that we ought to think about is are there places where the church today is not being effective? <laughs> are we are <laughs> we really open that all over the place think about are there places where we have decided it's better it's easier to compromise than to fight yeah yes yeah 
And so it's important to know that as we talk about the church at Pergamos and say, they just should have run out. Let's talk about the church in your house. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and not necessarily the church you attend, but what, what happens, there, there are places that we make decisions and what I think the letter to the Church of Pergamos is for us to see is that places we make decisions and we make decisions based on what's more comfortable for us than what is true. And one of the messages to the Church of Pergamum is, you have done this, you need to get right. Mm -hmm. He wanted them to get right. He <laughs> wanted them to figure this out. And so we just, we can't always retreat and leave, but it's important to do those things. I remember the first time I went to Las Vegas and, and I went to church in Las Vegas and I'm like, who has a church in Las Vegas? Do they really go to church in Las Vegas? <laughs> yes. Who yeah. would have church in Las Vegas? I they just that, have slot machines in the, in the court, <laughs> that's all. I thought I, thought I saw Sister group. Alvesta here. Um, and that's sister, sister Alfreda. I thought she was going to go. But Frida went to this big church in Las Vegas before she moved to Ypsilanti. And they have real big churches mm -hmm. in Las Vegas. Mm -hmm. And why not? Because that's yeah, where the world is. That's in where city. We, why not? <laughs> but we need to minister to people, don't we? That's right. Mm -hmm. Everybody goes to Las Vegas. I don't. <laughs> Well, I love everybody. it. New Orleans. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, everybody likes to go to New Orleans. Mm -hmm. Doug has his hand. Yes, you missed Doug. Him. Yeah, I was just going to say that the folks in Pergamus, so though, <laughs> they may have been compromising because they were threatened with death. Yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. we, we compromise. <laughs> We're not threatened with death. We just right. threatened with a, a decision and we still mm -hmm. compromise. Right, right. Yeah. I see your hand, Sister Alfreda. Well, yeah, I never lived in Las Vegas, but I did attend church there. Um, yeah. I visited there several times. But I do, yeah, there are church, there are places where churches are not effective because I have visited a church. My, a friend of mine has a attends a church uh, in another city and it's in um kind of a seedy area where there's a lot going on. In fact, there's a strip club across the street from the church. All right. And there is a, um, there's an apartment <laughs> complex uh, within walking distance of the church. And she would tell me frequently about the program. She was over the education ministry. And I was asking her, what about the kids uh, uh, in that apartment complex? Do you all go over there to men? Oh, no, we don't go over there. I said, what about the community? No, they don't go into the community. So here's this huge church in this community that does not minister the to community. the community. That's right. And I thought that was just so sad. I said, well, why not? Well, this is a lot is happening there. They are afraid mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. to extend themselves. Uh, I guess they're afraid of the people. I don't know. I said, why don't you just befriend them? You would never, you know, you really never know. And you could pass alcoholics. This is their church is just right here, and all this is going on across the street. But mm -hmm. they do not minister over mm -hmm. there because they are afraid of the people. My Lord. And I mentioned to her when we were having a picnic a couple, you know, back in the summer, and I said, Well, we invite the entire neighborhood, and she was just appalled. You have if anybody can come. There's a big sign out front that says welcome or something to that effect, but it's for the entire community. We purpose purposefully are planned it that way, but they don't do that. They go when they have their their uh, picnic or whatever, they get together in the um, summertime, they would go off to a park way out somewhere else, but outside of the community. So there are places where churches are in the community, but they do not uh, minister to the community. Amen, amen. And so you know, we, we can't always choose where we are planted. Right. What God sends us, but we can choose to say yes to Him. Mm -hmm. I know to Him. Yes, Sister Sylvia, I see another hand. Um, just as, as uh, she had said, Sister Alfreda had said about uh, not serving a community there, there's the, also the opposite on that, where, you know, we're supposed to love everybody, but not necessarily what they do. And mm -hmm. I know that's a big thing with homosexual uh, marriage and whatnot. And it's like, 
you, you, you're supposed to love the homosexual, but you're not supposed to take into your church and start marrying people, you know, same sex. And that is becomes one of the things of when you start compromising, either you're either not serving or you're gone to the point of you taking things over that maybe that, that, that isn't uh, in God's will. Yeah, you bend in the rules. Yeah. Well, I think I think the Lord asked us to, to again wherever we have been planted to minister to those people around us, and so we can't be afraid of what might happen for us. We have to do so because God asks us to do this, and so it was a difficult place to live. Pergamos was a difficult place to be a Christian because you did not necessarily participate in all the other things. You were left out of a lot of economic things. Right. You were left out of a lot of places that everybody else went to because you had made a, cho a choice, a decision to represent Jesus Christ yeah. here in this very difficult place. Yeah. Sister Avesta mentioned the fourth, the four cults. The one cult I want to mention is the cult of Aeschylus. Aeschylus was the god of healing. Yes. Mm -hmm. The Lord's of the Lord. snakes. Snakes. And the way that people got healed is that they would pay to spend time in the temple at night and they would go to sleep. And if the snakes would roll over you <laughs> while you were sleeping, yeah. <laughs> that you would wake no me up. You would be healed. No, you was in a trance or coma or whatever. <laughs> you would be, they, would, they, would, they did. They had some sort of trance that they would put you in. And oh. I don't know if they used drugs. Ain't or enough wine or nothing in the world. Ain't for enough? That. Ain't enough. No, no, no way. If it meant you could get healed. Mm -mm. Why? Isn't that where they got that symbol from? That medical symbol? That's yeah. the symbol yeah. of doctors yes. today. Yes. Is a exactly. snake wrapped around? Right. Is it a sword or oh. something? Or mm -hmm. around a staff? Yeah. Around a staff? Yeah. It does come from Aeschylus. Right. Yeah. Pharmaceutical. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so here you have a place where people are saying Jesus will heal you. Lord, and the same thing. This other man is selling healing by coming and have snakes roll over you. Well, we were, well, they're saying Jesus is all of that stuff, all those gods. He's, he is the God. He can heal you. He mm -hmm. can do all of those things. So of course they're like, oh, how can he be better than this God and this one and this one and this one? Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Because I, I think of it when, as I was reading it, I think of it as, um, and I don't mean any harm to anybody, but I think of it as some of the the, the, the commercials that come on religious TV about faith healing and these sorts of things. You can be healed <laughs> if, you, if, you, if you pay for these things. Right. Give me some money for these yeah. things and you can prayer be healed. Cloth. I don't know if it's prayer cloth or anointed oil yeah. or whatever it is. <laughs> um, but again, Aeschylus, the clinical of Aeschylus was making money by having people pay to come in be put in a trance and have snakes roll over them. And that was going to heal them. <laughs> when Jesus says, by his stripes, we are healed. Amen. Amen. And so people mm -hmm. often don't take the, the free thing that Jesus is offering. <laughs> really? They would rather pay for something that everybody else is going <laughs> to because it looks prosperous. Right. Oftentimes we are distracted by stuff that's flashy mm -hmm. that looks Tiny like object. it's working <laughs> that look like a lot is going on mm -hmm. when all it is is show and tell smoke mm -hmm. and mirrors that's right smoke and mirrors mm -hmm. sister lynn says she has a healing hanky for sand for sale <laughs> I got for one from years ago. Somebody brought me from overseas. For sale? <laughs> I'm just reading what she wrote in the chat. So. so here we have this church in Pergamum who is living in a very difficult place. What Jesus describes it as the place where Satan lives. Mm -hmm. Now, if I ask you today where Satan lives, what would be your answer? Mm -hmm. In the earth? Everywhere. 
in the earth. Uh, he lives in the earth. He is the yeah. prince and the power of the air. the air. He roams the earth. So he lives everywhere. And so right, he's not everywhere. He's, he not, he's not omnipresent. He's, he's not omnipresent. Roam. Right. That's but he he no. and his demons roam roam the earth. Roam the earth, yeah. That's what well, that was my answer. He and his demons are roaming the earth. And so we can say Pergamus was the place where Satan lived, but Satan lives in the earth. And so we too have to be aware. We too have to be aware that we are living in places where Satan has you. Satan has influence. We're living in places where Satan has influence. Are we going to follow his influence, allow his influence to take over our lives? Or are we going to be, as somebody used the word earlier, strong enough to resist that influence? Thank you. Well, we, I mean, we have him. We are, you know, we are. Oh. When I was reading this, it made me think about um, the persecution that Christians are going through. Even in Turkey today, there are mm -hmm. areas where mm -hmm. you have Christians who are being, their lives are being threatened because, you know, it's Muslim. Mm -hmm. And just, it just made me think about how they stand for God and their and Christianity and will not bow even though their lives are really being threatened. They can actually die tomorrow. You know, people are killing them. That just, yeah, when I was reading this and I'm like, and here I am, here there's no one after me or anything. I have free will, free, you know, what's my excuse? Right. But you don't, you don't have to go to Turkey I have a friend who pastors a church on the west side of Chicago, and I listen to the stuff that he talks about amongst the kids that he works with, because he's got a whole lot of gangbangers. They had one that he told me about when they were here a couple of weeks ago. Two guys shot some guy 67 times. And I'm like, and Derek, why do you stay there? And the answer is because that's where God has led him to. That's what God wants right. you to do. Right. Sister, and I admire him for it. Sister Angie, I thought you were trying to say something at one point. Oh, I was just going to say at one point, it, your relationship with God, if you truly, truly, truly are committed and you know who he is, you can stand in the face of adversity. And I remember as a child, um, we had this one lady and she was just, everywhere she went, she espoused Jesus and she... At one point, someone attempted to stab her, and she just put the Bible up, and the knife went into the Bible. Mm. And it was like, only God, you mm -hmm. know, because nobody thought the blade of the knife was so long that it would just stay there. But God. You know, but God. Mm -hmm. So, you know, but when she came out, she had another testimony. All right, all right. Mm -hmm. Amen. Sister Sylvia, you have your hand up? You're muted. The um, thing that I, like we were just talking about Turkey and people being killed, but to me, the more, the more uh, a more dangerous, um, um, I don't know what the, what, whatever I'm trying to say, but what is more dangerous is the, is the compromise, the pervasive, just uh, easing into stuff that we are, we go into now, that this society goes through now, that you start accepting things that, mm -hmm. you know, you shouldn't, and it, and it just becomes just easy. It's like things that you see in a commercial, and the kids see it, and then it just becomes, because it's normal. This is, this is advertising your, your, your Cheerios, or whatever it is, <laughs> and, and, Thing, and we become just in the next thing you know we're 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 entrenched into something that are, are in the ways that we should not be entrenched 
we and, and the thought processes that we should not have and to excuses that we make. And right. and to me, that is a more dangerous thing than, than the overt situation of run for your life because you know exactly what to do and where your danger is. But this is it's it's scary to me, especially in this country. Mm -hmm. So so if we look at what what Jesus says to church of Pergamum, I think it's verse 14. I have a few things against you, he says. Mm -hmm. yeah. I have a few things because you have them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed mm -hmm. to idols, and to mm -hmm. commit adultery. Mm -hmm. And so what they had is they allowed people in the church to lead people astray, mm -hmm. to bring in those other things that were not true, mm -hmm. but to slowly compromise on yeah. the way that they lived their lives. And so Jesus is saying, I have this against you, even though I realize the verse above talks about Antipas, who was a faithful witness and a faithful martyr. And the story is that Antipas refused to, to, to reject the name of Jesus Christ and that it put him into a big bronze bull and stuck the bull in the fire. And so he slowly roasted to death. Yeah. But he never refused to say he was, he rejected the name of Jesus Christ. And so there may be things that happen to us and things that are uncomfortable and inconvenient because we, we claim the name of Jesus Christ. But here Jesus says, what you have done is not just, you know, Jose, I'm holding up the bloodstained banner, but you have allowed people in your, con in your fellowship to teach mm -hmm. these things that yeah. are not true. Right. Mm hmm and you've allowed people, one word I think it's the new international version uses is that you use the word entice. Mm -hmm. Am I reading right? The new international version says you allowed people to entice the members mm -hmm. by the teachings of Balaam, like Balaam, Balaam who refused to curse God, refused to curse God's people, but said, if you really want to get God's people, then you get them through the women. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. So trying to teach people how to go around the word of God. Right. Yes, Minister Jeannie, you have mm -hmm. your hand up. Yeah, I was going to say, and, but we, we see it, but, and, and what happens is what you're saying is that slowly it becomes a part of who we are. Mm -hmm. And even we get this little, you, you, you know, you, you feel like, okay, is, is that right? And the one place you ask the question, where do we see this? in our churches and one place we see it is in terms of bring of drawing young people in we mm -hmm. we we, we, we we're not just teaching them if like if jesus said if i be lifted up mm -hmm. i'll draw if i be lifted up yeah. that is not what we're teaching that's true we got we we're, we are enticing and 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 we don't want to say that because right. it's going to offend the wrong person or, you know, so you don't want to be an offense to anybody, but I, I, I'm saying we're enticing and then anybody who need to pull me aside and we can have that discussion, but we are, in, we are in, not just our, not just our church, but most churches are trying to come up with some gimmick, gimmick. to get young people to come instead mm -hmm. of saying, look, let's just teach, teach them what we know, mm -hmm. because what happens is when we don't, then they arrive at adulthood blank. <laughs> and not able to right. function then we wonder what happened well right. what happened well they can't hold on to that ice cream parlor thing you gave them you know, they can't hold on to that thing <laughs> that's free <laughs> did, did you have your hand up Doug? Yeah, I, I, I was i was just going to say we we often talk about how churches or different congregations can't get together to work together for God, but I think this is one of the reasons why, because you said we shouldn't compromise. And I think we look at one another and, and although we may agree that Christ is Lord and that's the only way through salvation, some of those other things that we differ on are compromises that we can't tolerate. Okay. Mm -hmm. I, and I think that's what keeps us separated from working mm -hmm. together mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that people are looking for and, I think, and and people who don't know jesus and one of the things the world is looking for is authentic witnesses yes mm -hmm. yes 
Mm-hmm. And, and one of the things that we do is, I think as Minister Jeannie said, we try gimmicks, we try games, we try stuff to see if it works. And what I think a lot of young people want is just somebody who will talk to them straight <laughs> and say, I, I'm, I, I wanna hear you, yes, stuff. I think that having been one who went through many a bucket of candy bars in my time, the the word of God is enticing. Mm-hmm. What young people want to see, and I won't say that's wrong or right, is the current re- award or reward for listening to his word. All right, when, when I was doing it, for those of you who don't know, I had a, a five-gallon pail that was filled to the top with candy bars. Yeah, I know about that. Yes, and several adults tried to come into my class, and I wouldn't let them. <clears throat> But the thing of it was, was you had to do certain things. You had to remember, I had a game where you had to say the next verse of the Bible, put all the boys in a circle, start with Genesis, and they had to go around. And Lynn Baker's boys ended up generally winning that more often than the other. Because in fact, I heard they went to school and sold the candy bars. So were the candy bars an enticement? Sort of. They were more of a reward. It was the word of God that was bringing them in but I wanted to reward them to keep them. So right. it's, it's not just that it's, it's when you're enticing them with something that's false. Right. That's the problem. So, oh, hey, in my church, it's okay to do this. It's okay to do that. Okay, that's enticing, but it's also a lie. <laughs> and right? I think one of the things we don't realize is that the word of God is attractive. Mm-hmm. We don't really believe that, the, that Jesus okay. said, if I be lifted up, he would actually draw. We think we got mm-hmm. to do something else. When the word of God will draw, that's how I got saved was the word of God. Yeah, and th- seeing the, the ambassadors of God being authentic, that they are actually acting and behaving the mm-hmm. way that the, the, the teachings are. And right. that's the thing that turns uh, young people off. You know, they it's not do as I say, not as I do. Mm-hmm. I agree with you, but I also think that so often we teach hell and damnation. If yes. you do this, right. you're hell bound. If you, and you know, we we live in that era so much that we don't teach them all God, all Jesus said is love. He didn't ask us to judge. Mm-hmm. He didn't ask us to tell people who's going to heaven and hell. Because we don't know. We might nope. be on the opposite end and thinking we're going one way. Right. And if we teach kids that Jesus is love and not just you go into hell if you do this and brimstone, I think they'll come in. But you're right. We have to be authentic. We didn't get to where we are today just by osmosis. At least I didn't. It was a process. It's a process long right and we we used hell and damnation to scare people yes we do so we thought that sure was going to scare them into yep. salvation but that again the word of god says we lift up jesus yes yes minister Jeannie. i think all the educators on here would agree that there is a you have to look at young people and, and where and on a growth chart you what you can do so they know so that we understand that you can't teach hell and fire and brimstone at age five and six but now by the time they're 14 you ought to be done said you ought to be done told them that the wages of sin is death and the gift of god is eternal life and all liars will go to hell that's i mean i'm not teaching them something that the bible don't say mm-hmm. so it is by it is by you know their growth and development mm-hmm. i mean we got we smart right. enough to do that part out but mm-hmm. we can't we can't deny what the scripture says to be true is not to scare them. It is the truth. Right. That's how we should present it. This is, here's the truth. And I'm sure that there is some way that I'm not an educator, uh, but I'm sure that there is a way where you teach these lessons so that you don't present fear because the whole time we're saying that, you know, here's the truth, but the other truth is that fear don't, don't come from God. Right. Yeah, as a parent, not necessarily as an educator. As a parent, but as right? A parent, you have to show <laughs> you have to show them how to live in live in love, and that's 
how to be kind, how to forgive, how, how not to hold a grudge, how to help somebody when they, you know, when they need it, how to, how to help somebody when they don't need it. I mean, you know, whatever they're going, they're going to imitate you. They're going to, you know, they're going to see, they're going to pray. If they see you pray, whenever you're, you're troubled about something or you tell them that's what, that's what they're going to learn. Mm -hmm. And we have to oh. model that behavior. We have to model what it is you want to see in other people. Mm -hmm. And we have to be nice to them. Mm -hmm. um, we have to do that. You see Lynn's question? Uh, is that my grandchild asked what was wrong with Halloween. I told him how God spoke to me and he asked me why I choose to enjoy something opposite of him. I'm not sure what that means, but I think there is something to, to be taught about those sorts of things. I have never celebrated Halloween in my entire life. <laughs> but that was something my parents taught me from the very beginning. And so I think it is, is this how we live our lives and how we, we, we treat each other and how we, ex how we are examples of those things. What was happening in Pergamos is that the church was beginning to be inf infiltrated by people who were saying one thing and living a different life. And what we wanna be aware of is that that can happen in our churches. And number two, I don't wanna be that person. Me either. I don't wanna be the person who is living on the edge. I want to be the person who is living according to the word of God and doing my best to represent Jesus Christ in the earth. The second thing he, Jesus says to this church is that you have those people there who hold on, who hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Now in Ephesians, he told the church at Ephesus, you hate the people of the Nicolaitans. And I like this about you. Here in the church of Pergamum, he says, there are those of you who hold on to the people, uh, to the teachings of the Nicolaitans. And the Nicolaitans simply taught, it don't take all that. That's what they taught. They believed you could go to the temple and worship Athena as long as you came to church on Sunday. Mm -hmm. It was all right for you to pass through the temple and say, uh, Caesar is Lord, as long as you don't mean it in your heart. Mm -hmm. Uh, I can get away with living on the edge, good going in and out, as long as you know I find my way back in. Mm -hmm. And so, what we have here are these teachings, these teachings of compromise that existed in the church. And Jesus is saying to the church that this is a problem, and if you don't correct this problem, we're gonna have big difficulties. What did he tell them to do? Repent. Repent. Don't try to figure out, is it me or whatever? Repent. Mm -hmm. Don't try to point fingers at other people. Repent. Right. Say, Lord, forgive me for the times that I have compromised. Show me my error. Show me what I have done. I repent of those things so that I can be a true witness for Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut anybody off. Go ahead. No, I just say amen. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. Jesus said, if you don't repent, he said, otherwise, I am coming quickly. In verse 16. And what did he say he was going to do? Fight against Fight with the sword of his mouth. So who's fighting me? Who's going to be fighting? Jesus is coming to fight. Jesus is coming to fight. Mm -hmm. I will come mm -hmm. soon and fight, fight against, against you. With the sword of my mouth. Mm -hmm. So, in the fight between you and Jesus, who's going to win? Jesus. Jesus. <laughs> Always. No question. Oh, Always. <laughs> and he says, I'm coming to fight with you but with the sword in my mouth. Now, what's the sword in his mouth? His word. 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 The word of God is a two-edged sword. sword. It is the word of God. And it doesn't mean literally I'm coming to fight with you, but the word of God is going to come to you and show you that you are wrong. Mm -hmm. 
And it's that word of God that is important for us to have. And so Jesus says, repent or else I'm coming quickly. And the word that's in my mouth, I'm going to fight with you through the sword that's in my mouth. Mm -hmm. against, against you. That's right. I'm going to fight against you. And so in, in, in Roman culture, whoever had the sword had life, had, was able to give or take life. And so if the ruler, if Caesar held the sword that Caesar held and pointed at you, they could kill you at any given moment in time. And so Jesus here is saying, you're over there worshiping Caesar, but I got the real sword. Mm -hmm. The sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And so he says to the church, repent, go back and fix what it is that you have done. Go and say, God, show me my wrong so that I might be won back to you. Mm -hmm. Verse 17 says, whoever has ears, let them hear what the spirit says to the churches. Mm -hmm. To the one who is victorious, I will give some of the hidden manna. And I will only give that person a white stone on it with, mm -hmm. a, with a, a new name on it, known only to the one who receives it. What is manna? Bread. It was the bread that fell from heaven. Yeah. Yeah. And Jesus said, I am bread. bread of life. The bread of life. Bread of life. If you repent and if you hear what the Spirit is saying, then you will eat the bread of life. You will have hidden manna, new manna. This manna that's stored up just for you, the word of God will come and bear fruit in your life. And, I, and it's, it's just it's an amazing experience for me to realize that the word of God is bearing fruit in my life. That's something that encourages me. It supports me. It gives me the courage to do the next thing mm -hmm. because the word of God is bearing fruit in my life. Mm -hmm. And, and, and if, you, if, 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 I don't know how many, you know, but once I have learned something, it's hard to unlearn it. That's true. Okay. So I have learned, if I have learned that, that, that faith without works is dead, then I will know that all my faith has to follow. My works have to follow my faith. I will have learned those things because I put them into practice. Oftentimes, church people behave as if the word of God makes no difference in their lives. Mm. Ooh. I ain't talking about none of y'all. <laughs> but oftentimes, <laughs> oftentimes, church people behave as if the word of God makes no difference. As Brother Phelps was saying, that we, we, we can only agree we can't work together. And that means the word of God doesn't make a difference in our lives. We can't yield to somebody else being right. Right. Or somebody else having an idea. It has to be only my idea. Yeah. We can't find ways to love one another enough such that we can work together. Mm -hmm. There are places where we behave as if the word of God don't mean nothing. That's true. That's true. We talk about the preacher, as the minister said today, Reverend Portia said today, we talk about the people, but, and that's not what the word of God says for us to do. Right. Does it? No. no. But not if that's what love is. <laughs> <laughs> and so one of the things I think Jesus is telling the church of Pergamum is that your life is going to have to reflect the word of God. If the, if the word of God does not make a difference in how you live your life, then you are going to be lost. You are going to be lost. If the word of God doesn't make a difference in your life, if the word of the sword of the spirit, the word of God, the word of God that is sharp and powerful than any two-edged sword separating the joints and the marrow, if the word of God isn't powerful in your life, if it's not making a difference in the way we live our lives in this wicked world, because we always, we always interacting with Satan when we walk out to any place. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
If the word of God doesn't make a difference in how we live our lives, then we are falling prey to the error of Balaam and the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Amen. Jesus said to him that overcomes, I will give a white stone with a new name on it that only you yes. will know. Uh -huh. That yes. is a special invitation. The white yes. stone was a special invitation, a special invitation to be with Jesus, a special place with a new name. And I'll sing that song, we'll have a new name and glory. It's a new name. <laughs> Those who are redeemed have a new name. No longer are you <laughs> sinful, but we are now righteousness of Jesus Christ, the righteousness of God through Christ Jesus. When we are born, we are born anew. Yes, Sister Alfreda. Oh, no. Oh, I thought you had your hand up. I'm sorry. We are, have this new life and this new birth experience, and God wants that life to grow day in and day out. But how we deal with the word of God is imperative for us to see that how we deal with the word of God reflects on how we live our lives. Yeah. Yeah. If we don't want to fall prey to the error of the church of Pergamum, then we're going to have to make certain that the word of God is bearing fruit in our lives. Mm -hmm. And we're not just taking it as something I can pick and choose. That's right. I can do commandments one, two, and four, but five and six and seven, I don't have to do. <laughs> uh, I don't even know what five, six, and seven are. But uh, I'm wrong with that. Okay. <laughs> I don't remember right on top of my head. I'm not five, but not mother. That's five. <laughs> okay. Okay. Seven is thou shalt not secure still. Uh, I think so. <laughs> See? I, I just can't do that one today. <laughs> we don't get to pick and choose. That's right. No. That's true. It is the entire word of God that God asks us to learn mm -hmm. and to practice. Mm -hmm. I can't just live, well, I can't just live part of it. <laughs> what happens if I just live part of it? Mm -hmm. You, you, uh, You're lying. You got shortcomings. That's going mm -hmm. over the edge. <laughs> Not living on the edge. That's over the edge. Going That's over the edge. edge. <laughs> you're lukewarm. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, you're just failing all the other ones. That's it. <laughs> it's not what you, it's not what you did. It's what you didn't get done. Right. Right, and so the church of Laodicea was lukewarm. <laughs> the church of Pergamos has yeah. fallen into error <laughs> because they allowed people to teach them things that were not of the word of God and begin to follow those things that were not of the word of God. Any questions you might have? Hopefully, Kathy, we answered your question. Very much so. Yeah. Yeah, understood. Any questions or comments you want to share with us today? Mm. Mm. Uh, how did the folks get away with not going to the temple with the, uh, <laughs> and, and, and bowing before the, uh, the guy there? I don't know. I think part of it, it was a big city. And so... They called in sick. <laughs> they couldn't keep track of them. <laughs> they, they, they didn't have good... They didn't have, always have the best tracking mechanism. The other thing is that the church often met outside of the city and not in the city in particular. And the people never went into the city. They lived... They would go into the city during the day to minister and go out at night back to the place where, this, where the church lived. So they didn't have to do commerce in the city, their business or whatever? They couldn't. Hmm. They couldn't do commerce in the city if they didn't worship at the temple of Athena or Zeus or Caesar. They couldn't. They were outside the regular economy of the city. The thing that's encouraging to me is that still there were people who were faithful to God, 
in those particular circumstances. And if people can be faithful to God in those circumstances, nothing should stop me from being faithful to God in my mm. circumstance. True. As, as Sister Winnie said, there are people in Turkey now that are still be, that are being you know, crucified and being uh, persecuted just because they are Christians. Mm -hmm. There are people in this country now who are being persecuted for their belief in Jesus Christ. I don't think any of us have had to have that particular stand yet. But yeah. the scripture does teach yeah. us that a day is coming mm -hmm. Soon. where we will all have to give an account <laughs> and we will all have to say Jesus is Lord. Yeah. Oh. So next week, I need you to start reading First Kings. First Kings chapter 16 through chapter 22. Learn all about Jezebel. Uh -oh. First Kings. First Kings okay. chapter 16 through chapter 22. I want you to learn all about Jezebel. All right. First Kings chapter 16 uh -huh. and read through chapter 22. You're going to put it in your memo. I will. <laughs> I, will, I, will rem I will remind you, but I thought I would tell you today yeah. so that you could get a head start. Oh, we're going, we're going to dig up what 16. we can on Jesse, huh? On Jesse. Jesse, that's what Okay. Some people think Jezebel gets a bad rap. First Kings chapter 22. And Ahab. Mm -hmm. First Kings chapter 16, 16 through chapter 22. Yeah, you're not asking us about him. You just want to know about her. We're talking about Jezebel <laughs> because the church at Thyatira. Okay. Jezebel was mentioned to the church at Thyatira, our next church that we will study, Revelation okay. chapter 2, verse 18. It is the church at Thyatira. Okay. Verse 22. 16 to 22. Well, he tells them, you tolerate that woman, Jezebel. Yes. That woman. That, that's what the Bible says. <laughs> you got to fasten our seatbelts lest we see her. <laughs> woman, you <laughs> okay, I just have to say this. I, <laughs> just, no disrespect. So isn't it Jezebel who first asked the question, who let the dogs out? <laughs> <laughs> All right, Doug. <laughs> oh, oh, my God. <laughs> oh, this no, I, mean, I should have given a spoiler alert before I said that, but. Oh, yeah. This is gonna be good. I, I wouldn't miss it. Oh, yeah. oh, I just I think it's important for you to know about Jezebel. <laughs> Beyond what we think we know. Beyond what you think you know. <laughs> I can't do it. Beyond what we think we know, because I think it is important to see that in the Church of Thyatira. <laughs> I think the Bible says that you put up with this woman. <laughs> oh we. You tolerate. <laughs> King James says you suffer. Mm -hmm. This woman, Jezebel. <sighs> so we need to know what the church is putting up with. Mm -hmm. And some history can be found in 1 Kings chapter 16 through chapter 22. 16 to 22. All right. Yes, yes. Let's pray. <laughs> 